I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Caitlin. Um, Kindberg, who's very kindly uh, joined us today. Caitlin is the VP of Patient Success at an orthopedic services startup, and she enjoys watercolor, painting, baking, and playing volleyball in her free time. Her symptoms began in early childhood, but she wasn't diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia until she was 25 years old. As a speaker with Project Sleep's Rising Voices program, she will now share her story from first noticing that her sleepiness was different to getting a proper diagnosis while raising awareness of this sleep disorder. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. All right, so thank you for this invitation to speak. I'm honored to share my story today with you all. I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. And there's also a brief audience survey to complete before the next speaker comes on. To give you a general sense of who I am, I was born in Temecula, the wine country of Southern California. I was born prematurely at four pounds and four ounces. You can see how small I was in the picture on the top left. That's why my dad is holding out his hand for reference. I remember when I asked what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would always say that I wanted to be a NICU nurse since I was born prematurely and spent a few weeks in the NICU myself as a baby. I have one brother who's eight years older than me. In the middle is a photo of us being cute, cuddling on the couch together. <laughs> our parents got divorced when I was only a couple months old. So unfortunately for most of our lives, we, we never um, really spent you know, much time and lived under the same roof. But over time, our sibling bond has grown and he actually flew all the way from Arizona to be here today. <laughs> I was a pretty outdoorsy kid. At my mom's house, I would swim in the pool and go to the river where my family would either take me out on our boat or our jet skis. With my dad, we would go to the beach. A picture of me at the, at, I think San Clemente Beach is on the right. And we would also drive out to Glamis to camp and ride quads together. So although I was a very active kid, my parents told me that when I was very young, I would fall asleep pretty much anywhere out at restaurants, in the car, at the dinner table, on the couch, and my favorite was on the carpet next to our fireplace. In elementary school, I was in the talented and gifted program, so I was basically a little nerd. In middle school, I played soccer for a year until I got red carded during a game due to my competitiveness and perhaps some underlying anger issues. I decided that I should try a different sport like volleyball where there was a net between me and the opposing team. While I was active playing volleyball, I would always be relatively awake. But on the rides home from away games, I would pass out on the floor of the bus. But so did my other teammates, so I wasn't the only one. The picture on the left is me playing varsity volleyball during a breast cancer awareness month, hence the pink hair. I'm number six in the front. In high school, my class superlative was most involved as I was in National Honor Society, Key Club, Math Club, and Student Council. The picture in the middle is of me getting inducted into the National Honor Society with one of my best friends, Jasmine, and my favorite teacher. I'm on the right. One day during history class, my sophomore year in high school, we were watching videos of historical events that had happened don't ask me which ones because I honestly can't recall. But I do remember this day because although history was my least favorite subject, I was excited that we were watching videos in class rather than reading aloud, which made me anxious. I always sat in the front of the class because of my terrible eyesight and my history teacher dimmed the lights so we could all see the screen better. And shortly after, I noticed my head getting very heavy. So I propped my head up on my desk with my arm, and the next thing I knew, I was woken up abruptly to the point where I nearly jumped out of my seat when my teacher slammed his yardstick on, on my desk and told me that I needed to pay attention. At this point, everyone's heads had turned to look at me instead of the videos that we were watching, and he said that if I fell asleep in class again, that he would tell my mom, who just so happened to be our high school librarian. As someone who had never fallen asleep in class before, this was jarring to me and I was completely mortified in front of my entire class. 
It was important for me to be engaged at school, so I was really hard on myself for falling asleep in the classroom. At 16, I started dating my first boyfriend, the principal's son. <laughs> the picture on the right is of us together prior to a date night for our anniversary. One time I was over at his house and we were watching SpongeBob of all things. I remember just sitting on the couch in his very cold house with the thermostat set at 66 degrees. And one minute I was watching SpongeBob hunt down jellyfish and the next minute I remember waking up to his parents coming home and asking what we wanted for dinner, which happened to be a couple hours after I had fallen asleep on the couch. So I was really embarrassed that his parents had seen me sleeping and thought they probably thought I was lazy. I also felt bad for falling asleep when I was supposed to be spending quality time with my boyfriend. As time went on, I noticed that my sleepiness was impacting my relationships and friendships as I was unable to stay out late with them, would often be too tired to hang out so I'd cancel plans last minute, and would fall asleep on their couch watching movies so my mom got worried when I didn't come home. Despite my sleepiness throughout high school, I graduated in the top 10% of my class. The photo on the left is of me at my high school graduation. The summer after my senior year in high school, I worked at an RV resort and launch ramp. One day after administering boat launch passes for eight hours, I got in my car to head home. I remember noticing the sky filled with red, orange, and yellow hues because Arizona has the most spectacular sunsets. I hit some light traffic on the freeway, so I started to slow down and rolled down my windows to enjoy the fresh air despite it being 105 degrees outside. And once the traffic cleared, I sped up, and the next thing I knew I was hitting what I call sleepy bumps on the side of the road. But I think the technical term is a rumble strip. This was the first time I had ever dozed off behind the wheel, so I was feeling quite shocked and scared. I blasted some Taylor Swift and turned my air conditioning on high to make it the rest of the way home. This was really alarming to me as this is the first time this had ever happened and I felt concerned for my safety, but I brushed it off just thinking that I had a long day. Once summer was over, I moved to Oregon to attend college as a pre-nursing major at Southern Oregon University. Unfortunately, that first time in history class wasn't the last time I fell asleep in class. I vividly remember falling asleep in my general chemistry lecture during my first semester. Due to not taking chemistry in high school, never having to study up until that point, and my sleepiness, I ended up failing general chemistry and having to retake it, which then made me rethink my whole life and career. So this resulted in me switching to become a business major, but switching my, business, switching my major did not make me feel less sleepy. My schedule in college went a little like this. I would wake up feeling what I would describe as foggy and half asleep still, just kind of going through the motions. I would drink three cups of coffee in the morning, go to classes, and morning classes were always my favorite. Then I would drink a large energy drink in the middle of the day, go to work, study, take a nap, wake up to eat dinner, feel like a zombie, and then go back to bed an hour or two later. After doing that on repeat for four years, I ended up graduating with my bachelor's in business administration with a concentration in marketing and a double minor in chemistry and biology. Upon graduation, I got a marketing coordinator job at an orthopedic implant company in Nashville, Tennessee. This was when I really started to notice my sleepiness affecting me and my ability to work. From trying to stay awake on the 30 minute commute to and from work, preventing myself from dozing off at my desk at 3 p.m. by going for a walk around the business park, traveling on weekends with late nights and early mornings for cadaver labs. Yes, I said cadaver labs. The picture on the right is one of those early mornings at a cadaver lab. And this is me dressed in scrubs. So as you can probably imagine, I was pretty exhausted after doing this for two years. I started getting really bad anxiety attacks and would break out in what I call anxiety rashes, but my healthcare providers called it flushing. The final tipping point for me was when COVID hit and I was working up to 60 hours a week. 
That's when I decided that one, it was time to get a new job, and two, time to see a doctor and start searching for answers. When I was 22, I went to my primary care doctor and the initial reason I went was because of these anxiety attacks and flushing on my neck and chest that I experienced. That's pictured on the left. But since I was already there, I started to explain how tired I felt all the time. My concerns weren't taken seriously and he couldn't understand what was causing my fatigue. Many, many blood tests were performed, but all the results came back in the normal range. My vitamin D levels were a little low, so I was told to take a vitamin D supplement every day. After numerous visits, my primary care doctor diagnosed me with depression and put me on antidepressants, most of which had awful side effects and caused many sleepless nights. Then a few years later, at my friend's birthday trip in Gatlinburg, I started talking with one of his friends that I had never met before and asked him what he did for work. He explained that he was a respiratory therapist and started talking to me about what his day-to-day -day life looked like. This led to me telling him about my sleepiness and that's when he suggested that I see a sleep specialist. So that's how I got referred to a sleep specialist, not by my PCP, but by a stranger that I met in a cabin in Gatlinburg. During my first appointment with a sleep specialist, I completed a sheet asking how likely I was to fall asleep during certain activities and how often this occurred. It was surprising to me how many of those bubbles I filled in. It was in that moment that I sighed of relief because I knew that I was finally in the right place to receive some kind of diagnosis. When my physician assistant sat down with me in the exam room, he asked me when my symptoms started. That's when I broke down in tears and said, ever since I can remember. Shortly after I stopped crying, my physician assistant said, we're in this together. He started with an at-home overnight sleep study to rule out sleep apnea, and then did a daytime sleep study and another in-lab overnight sleep study, followed by a daytime sleep study, where I had to take multiple naps throughout the day. So that's what's pictured on this slide, is all of the cords that were attached to my head. Um, and the results of this led to a diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia at 25 years old. I thought I would start treatment and then finally feel normal and just as rested as everyone else, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. I hadn't heard of idiopathic hypersomnia prior to being diagnosed and I'm researching and I'm still like researching it incessantly after being diagnosed. I read numerous scientific papers and connected with other people with IH to learn more about their experiences. So today I'm going to share a bit about idiopathic hypersomnia because it is a central disorder of hypersomnolence that is underrecognized and misunderstood. Idiopathic hypersomnia is a chronic neurological sleep disorder. People with IH are very sleepy despite getting normal or longer amounts of sleep, but the exact cause is not known. It's estimated to affect 1 in 20,000 people, about 17,000 Americans, and 400,000 people wor worldwide. To put it into perspective, this equates to approximately 79 people right here in Philly. Idiopathic hypersomnia symptoms vary by person and may include trouble staying awake and alert during the day, which is called excessive daytime sleepiness. So examples of this were when I was falling asleep at my boyfriend's house and in history class. People with IH may also experience long sleep duration, so although sleeping for long periods at night is not a requirement of the disorder, people with IH typically sleep for at least 11 hours a day and may sleep for 14 hours or more during a 24-hour period. I don't sleep this much on a daily basis, but there are a few days a month where I sleep 11 or 12 hours. People with IH may also experience unrefreshing sleep, so even a full night's sleep or long naps result in feeling no better or worse upon waking than when falling asleep. So example of this was when I was coming home to nap after classes and work, waking up to eat dinner, feeling like a zombie, and then going back to bed an hour or two later. People with IH may also feel groggy, confused, or disoriented when waking up from an overnight sleep or nap. This is called sleep inertia or sleep drunkenness and may last for hours after waking up. I experience this occasionally and often take a nap within two hours after waking up on these days. 
Booth IH may also have an extreme difficulty waking up. So people with IH commonly fall back asleep multiple times while trying to awaken and need multiple alarms or assistance from others. I used to need multiple very loud alarms or my mom to wake me up for school, but now I don't even use an alarm. People with IH can also fall asleep accidentally, for example, while driving or working. So an example of this was when I fell asleep at the wheel driving home from work. I have fallen asleep behind the wheel multiple times and one time that I can remember at my desk at work. People with IH can also experience mental fogginess or brain fog, which impairs cognitive functions such as thinking and articulating thoughts clearly, remembering, concentrating, and paying attention. This is something that has become more and more apparent in my life, and it's so frustrating. It's also sometimes embarrassing, like when I'm playing board games with my friends and can't recall things or even process the, the instructions, which just makes me feel stupid. Some people with IH also experience headaches, dizziness, or cold hands and feet. I experience all the above. And lastly, they can experience difficulty with social life, work, or study because of sleepiness, which can also lead to depression. I mainly struggle with the motivation and energy to work. Believe it or not, I didn't really have much of an issue with studying in college, mainly because I loved pretty much all of my classes, so it was fun for me. Diagnosis usually involves medical tests to check for other potential causes of sleepiness, such as narcolepsy or other sleep disorders. Seeing a sleep specialist is recommended. A healthcare provider will ask questions about symptoms and sleep. Some providers may ask people to monitor their sleep and wake activity for several days by keeping a sleep diary or wearing a clinical device, for example, an actigraph. To check for other sleep disorders, an overnight sleep study, also called a polysomnogram, is done followed by a multiple sleep latency test the next day, where the person is asked to nap for 20 minutes every two hours. People who fall asleep very quickly but don't enter into REM sleep may have idiopathic hypersomnia. Both tests are done in a sleep center or lab with stick-on sensors that measure breathing, heart rate, brain activity, and body movements while asleep. As there is currently no cure for IH, the goal of treatment is to live well by managing alertness. <clears throat> treatment for symptom management varies by person, but may include medications to help people feel more alert and active when awake, and to sleep more deeply at night. These may include stimulants, non-stimulant wake-promoting agents, oxibates, antidepressants, and medications that target the GABA system. Only one medication is approved by the FDA specifically for IH. The other medications are known to be effective as treating sleepiness and other disorders such as narcolepsy and are used off-label to treat IH. Treating other sleep disorders and avoiding certain medications is helpful to reduce other potential causes of sleepiness. Coping strategies vary by person, but may include social support such as meetup groups or social media, counseling with a therapist for emotional support and to develop strategies for navigating life with IH, and improvement in general health and wellness through sleep hygiene, diet, and fitness. What I found most helpful are specifically when I was newly diagnosed, I attended social support groups through Wake Up Narcolepsy. It was helpful because I didn't know anyone else with narcolepsy or IH. This is also where I learned about clinical trials and other resources available through the various nonprofits like Hypersomnia Foundation and Project Sleep. I've also found that histamine-directed medications that I was only able to receive through a clinical trial, as it's only approved for narcolepsy right now and they're doing research to determine whether it's effective for people with IH. My experience with the clinical trial has been amazing and worth every seven hour round trip drive to Memphis. My clinical study doctor is the only doctor I've ever had that truly listens to me, educates me, and asks me about other aspects of my life like my relationships, work, hobbies, etc. Additionally, I take scheduled daytime naps when I feel like I just can't keep my eyes open any longer or when my schedule permits. It's important to note that IH isn't a psychiatric disorder, but counseling helps with managing symptoms related to the diagnosis and creating strategies for coping with symptoms. 
I found counseling to cope with my chronic illness diagnosis very helpful and was fortunate, fortunate to find a licensed provider in my state that's familiar with central disorders of hypersomnolence and the impact that they can have on one's life. Lastly, after trying and failing multiple stimulants, I've been trying to get on a nighttime medication for the past year, as it's the only FDA-approved medication for IH. However, it's been a constant battle with my insurance company. After many, many prior authorizations being denied, my insurance finally approved this medication as of last month. I used to be a perfectionist that was really hard on myself. I felt as if I was never doing good enough and that if I slept in or took a nap that I was being lazy or, as my parents used to say, wasting daylight. I've had to find companies and roles that allow me the flexibility to take the naps when I need it. But most of the time I hide this or just put a block on my calendar. When my fiance and I went on a vacation to the Bahamas where he proposed, pictured on the left, I needed to ensure that I didn't overexert myself and allowed time for scheduled naps, which I'm very grateful that I did because I had no idea that he was proposing that day. Thankfully, most people in my life have been very, fairly supportive of my IH. One thing my fiance always does when I look tired or when we've had a busy day is ask if I need a nap because he knows that I usually just try to push through. However, it feels like some of my family members or friends don't even want to try to understand what I'm going through. So I wish people would just ask more questions, specifically how they can support me. Every day I fight to stay awake and it's exhausting, but if I don't tell people, they have no idea. When I started posting about my diagnosis on LinkedIn, my coworker said, I had no idea that you were going through this. You seem fine and you're such a hard worker. So on the outside, everyone sees me as a successful, young, hardworking woman, but the reality is everything I've accomplished takes twice the effort. It's challenging to come to terms to, with the fact that IH is chronic and incurable. The only treatments out there are to manage symptoms, not to cure them. This has caused a lot of grief for me, grief of what my life could be like in my mid-20s if I didn't live with a central disorder of hypersomnolence. But now I'm a homeowner, planning my wedding, and still playing volleyball, just now it's on the sand instead of indoors. In the middle is the last volleyball tournament I played in, and on the right is the day my fiance and I closed on our house. I've learned that you never truly know what someone is going through. On the outside, they may seem happy and like they're living a good life, but on the inside, they could be struggling immensely. I've come to really appreciate the little things in life and take pride in all that I've accomplished while unknowingly dealing with a serious sleep disorder. My mission in life is to help others and create deep, authentic relationships. I try to do this with almost everyone I meet, but especially with my friends. The picture on the left is my fiance and I with our closest friends at a rooftop happy hour, and I'm in the middle in the green dress. I want to have an epic story to tell when I'm old about all the different ways that I contributed to society. Whether that's advancing medicine through clinical research, advocating for patients with rare disorders, or as of two weeks ago, finally starting my small business for my watercolor paintings and calligraphy, like I had been thinking about doing for the past couple of years. In the middle is the logo for my newly created business. So I would say that my diagnosis has actually given me a purpose in life, one that I had been trying to find for years. Initially, I got involved in Global Genes Rare Compassion Program, where they pair you with a medical student that's interested in the field of your diagnosis so they can learn how to be a better, more compassionate doctor. I've also become pretty passionate about sleep advocacy. I recently attended Hypersomnia Foundation's Beyond Sleepy Conference in Indianapolis back in June and I left speechless. I saw so many familiar faces from Wake Up Narcolepsy support groups and met many more new faces. It was an amazing experience to be in a room full of people that understand what you're going through and are searching for answers to help those with central disorders of hypersomnolence. After attending, I felt even more compelled to get in involved in patient advocacy. The picture on the right is of me participating in the PJ 5K run before the last day of the conference, which I woke up at 5 a.m. for. <laughs> After the conference, I started Project Sleep's Rising Voices program. 
Now, just a few short months later, instead of being in the audience, I'm up here today speaking to you all and sharing my story. So because of low awareness, even among physicians and misperceptions, people with idiopathic hypersomnia typically go years or even decades between symptom onset and diagnosis. It's estimated that the majority of people with IH are currently undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. It took 25 years for me to get diagnosed as I feel like my symptoms started at a very young age, but really just my memory of them became apparent in high school and have progressed since then. This picture was part of a campaign with Project Sleep for World Narcolepsy Day, which was yesterday, where you depicted how many years it took to get diagnosed in a creative way. So although IH is classified as a rare disorder, sleep disorders affect an average of one in five one in five Americans. The issue is that not many people know about IH and sometimes doctors may even need help understanding it. So I would encourage you all to raise awareness with me by getting involved in the Hypersomnia Foundation, Project Sleep, Wake Up Narcolepsy, and Narcolepsy Network. I would also ask that you really check in on those that are close to you. If you notice a friend or family member experiencing any of these symptoms I talked about today, encourage them to see a board certified sleep specialist. If you're a person with a sleep disorder or suspect that you have a sleep disorder, I would encourage you to never stop advocating for yourself and don't be afraid to find your healthcare, part healthcare partner that works for you. So I'm sharing my story today as part of Rising Voices, a program of the nonprofit organization Project Sleep, which empowers patient advocates to share their stories and improve public understanding of sleep disorders. Please take a moment to provide your feedback on this presentation by following the QR code to take a brief audience survey. Thank you for listening to my story. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, any questions for Caitlin? Raise your hand. Um, in the middle there, you dropped in a very interesting uh, little detail about you used to use multiple alarms and now you don't. Um, what happened? Yeah, so I think that kind of goes back to what Dr. Anne Marie Morris was saying, just about how it's a journey and I have a lot of responsibilities now. I own a house, you know, that requires cleaning almost every day because we have a very large <laughs> Newfoundland puppy that sheds everywhere. And, you know, I. I'm the only full-time employee at a startup company. And so like that just, I think it's just kind of adapting and I don't know, I feel like also sometimes I'm just kind of like fueled by anxiety. It's just, it's weird, but I, I don't need an alarm to wake up anymore. Like even I think yesterday I woke up at 5.30 in the morning to go play volleyball and Set an alarm just in case, but woke up at 526, just ready to go. So, so I think it's just kind of, you know, depends on the season of life that you're in. And yeah, that's kind of how it's, it's changed and progressed for me. I just wanted to ask about your clinical trials. I mean, did you have to go off medication for a while before that for people who want to do this? Yeah, so typically you do, and in my case specifically, I actually wasn't taking any medications at the time, so it was the perfect opportunity for me to start that clinical trial. Um, and then, yeah, I would go every, I think once a month, I would have to drive to Memphis for in, like in-clinic visits, and then, um, you know, after that, now I'm in the, I forget, I forget what it's called, but like the open label phase, I think it is. So now I can incorporate other medications. They, they kind of allow that and are still just kind of monitoring my progress remotely. Okay, do you happen to know how long people would have to be off meds or you don't know that because you didn't have to go through that? Yeah, I think it depends specifically okay. on, the, on the clinical trial. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you well, for your presentation, <laughs> I appreciate it. Has anybody ever suggested that it was your preterm birth that kind of contributed to your condition? Or have you heard of that with others? Yeah, I have heard it from others from the last hypersomnia um, Beyond Sleepy conference that I that I attended, but none of my doctors have really said any like said anything significant about it. But I guess to just kind of give you some more context, I was 
like always sick as a child, like constantly on antibiotics. My mom told me that I had spinal meningitis as well, like a pretty severe case of it. Um, so, and then I had ear tube surgery, which my eardrum like didn't hear, heal properly, which caused some hearing loss in one ear as well. Um, so yeah, I would say that there's kind of quite a few things that could be playing a factor, but there's really, again, we don't really know what causes it, so it's hard to like pinpoint where it could have potentially, you know, started. Brother. Big brother has a question. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> you seem like you have everything under control. Do you feel there's a percentage uh, that you have under control or do you think that you have uh, more progress to make? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always more progress to make. I kind of shared a lot of the highlights today, but I will say like it hasn't always been that way. There's definitely days, you know, where my sleepiness just kind of takes over and I've learned to really recognize that and appreciate that and just take the time to rest when I feel like I need it. So it's just kind of listening to my body and adapting my, my schedule to kind of accommodate that because in the past, I <laughs> overworked myself a lot and was just put so much pressure on myself to be this high achiever, and it was exhausting. So I think now just giving myself a little bit more grace has, has allowed me to, to accomplish everything that I have. Could you say a little bit more about how you handle driving and sleepiness? Yeah, so specifically for those drives to Memphis, I would typically do them by myself and they were three and a half hours. So I would kind of, you know, just prepare with some energy drinks. My fiance is always like, you know, take at least two energy drinks with you. And then oddly enough, like eating while driving helps keep me awake too. Um, or just turning up music really loud, singing along. Those are all things, but again, if I notice that I'm kind of, you know, like about to nod off, like you can obviously feel like it's coming on, like I'll just pull off over there on the side of the road and, you know, take a nap if I need to, get, get out at a rest area. So really just kind of, you know, being aware of when it's about to come on and um, being able to accommodate for that. Hi, Caitlin. We were in Rising Voices together. I'm Mary. We were in the check-in meeting. Yeah, I was on like, Mondays. I recognize your face. Yeah. <laughs> so, hello. And I feel for you on the prior authorizations for medication. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you, like, you said you were struggling to get it approved for a long time. How did you get it approved? Do you have tips for others? Like when you were like coming up short and not getting the approvals, like what did you do? Were you able to find help through like your doctor or your insurance company? Like how did you manage all that? It can be really challenging. Yeah, so it's definitely exhausting, you know, going through that whole process. For me personally, I ended up finding a new doctor that um, was able to kind of move it along a little bit faster. And I think just really making sure that the documentation is all there, because I know for me personally, you know, I had to try and fail all these other stimulants. So just making sure that the doctor really, you know, documents like she tried this, it didn't work, you know, she's still falling asleep behind the wheel, like things just like kind of creating the whole like full picture because I think with a lot, a lot of times with these insurance companies, like a human isn't even looking at it. It's just automatically gets rejected. Um, like actually when I was trying to get approved for one of the medications that it said I needed to, to try first, they denied that medication. And so it was just like, okay, wh like what's going on here? So um, they ended up approving that, but I would say just kind of stick with it I know that some of the nonprofit organizations have uh, resources online as well that you can um, look over, but. If I could just add to that. Um, so it, since there's only one FDA approved drug for idiopathic hypersomnia, some tips that can be utilized. Um, so number one, um, if it gets denied, have your doctor do a peer to peer. And when they do the peer-to-peer, -peer, typically the approach I take is saying, um, I just want to confirm the reason you're denying this drug 
is because you want them to utilize. And I usually will say like modafinil or stimulant, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to confirm that the approach that you typically take in congestive heart failure is to use a non-FDA approved drug over the only FDA approved drug for the treatment of congestive heart failure. I'm just confirming that because I want to make sure my patient isn't being discriminated against because they have a diagnosis that you don't understand. And most typically, what you'll get is a pause. Your approval number is. Um, and, and the reality is, is that if insurances want to play games, you can play the games back. And so uh, that is a very, very successful technique. Um, uh, and it does help in expediting the process. And I have experienced that same thing that you've said, that they'll say, you can't use this, you have to use modafinil or whatever, and then you go to order it, and they say, that's not, a, that's, that's not been studied in idiopathic hypertomia. Um, so I do think um, you're correct in saying, we want to make sure all the diagnostic stuff is there, but also making sure that if you can tell your doctor, create a little templated thing. Um, I even add that into my note, and many times I don't even get it denied, I'll just go through. The other piece that is really important about Jazz Pharmaceuticals is that if your doctor orders that drug and it gets denied, and there's a lag between that denial, um, they will actually, for, for some insurances, they will be able to provide free drug while you're waiting for that to get overridden. And, ja and you would wanna talk to Jazz about that to be able to confirm whether or not you have that insurance or not. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of online questions um, for you. Actually, the question is, what medicine do you take? Yeah, so <clears throat> through the clinical trial, I take Wakex or Pitolicent. And then the one that I just got approved for is Zywave. OK, the next question here. Has histamine, has the histamine study drug actually helped? As which, which drug? This is the histamine study. Pitolicin, yeah. Yeah, so I think it was kind of hard to tell initially. And for me, I had like this certain gene, I think it's like CYP2D6 or something where I couldn't take the highest dose. Mm -hmm. And I was very like not tolerant of that dose either because of that reason. Um, but I could tell it was working when I was on the highest dose. Uh, but they dropped me down to the middle dose. And I do notice some difference. But for me, yeah, it just wasn't like super life changing. Um, so that's why I'm you know, fortunate to have gotten onto Zywave as well. But I think also just like Dr. Anne-Marie Anne -Marie Morris said of just, you know, Making some lifestyle adjustments too have helped, you know, cleaning up your diet, you know, maintaining active, things like that. Again, it's not going to cure it, but I think those are things that have helped me personally. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I want to say that I really enjoyed your presentation. And even from the doctor's presentation first and yours, I didn't know that um, elementary school students go through this or that it can start so young. I know for me, it started in my 20s, but I really didn't recognize that it was something of a condition until like later. But a lot of your story or your testimony I actually can identify with. And um, it's just so interesting because my daughter is here with me and she is an educator. And just already just, you know, noticing that students fall asleep in class and even just with my own experience with certain things in education, it's just good to know that this can start with children in elementary school. And it's so sad that you have to go through life, you know, past college or you graduate to get a diagnosis, you know, so that's it. Good point, thank you. All right. Caitlin, thank you very much.